Welcome to the uh, IHPI seminar series. Today we are, um, have two speakers. Our first speaker, are you going to speak first, Sarah? I assume. Sarah Miller is going to speak first. Um, Professor Miller has a PhD in economics um, from the University of Illinois. She was a Robert Wood Johnson, um, not clinical scholar, health policy scholar at the University of Michigan. And she is now a professor at the uh, business school. And she's going to be talking about, um, her focus is on health policy and the short and long run effects of Medicaid policy in particular. Sarah is using a database um, that um, Clint Carter is the administrator of. So one of the reasons we wanted them to come and speak was to give all of you an idea of what you could do with this fabulous data that they have. So after Sarah's presented her research, uh, Mr. Carter's going to come up and present some of the details of what's available for other research as well. Thank you. Great, well thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to be able to talk to you, you know, not only about my research about the Affordable Care Act, but also kind of sell the research data center that we have here at the University of Michigan. It's such a fantastic resource uh, for researchers. I remember when I was in graduate school, I, ha I wanted to use some restricted use census data for my PhD, and I had to drive three hours to go to the RDC up in Chicago, and then work all day, and then drive three hours back. So it's just, um, it's such a tremendous resource to have um, our, our RDC here on campus. So I think it's something you know, everyone should take advantage of. So the research I'm going to present that uses data that is restricted use data from the RDC is about um, the consequences of the ACA Medicaid expansions. This is a project that's joint with Laura Wary, who's at UCLA. Um, so uh, just to give you um, a little bit of background on Medicaid, originally, uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid was a program that provided health insurance to certain groups within the low-income population. So for example, low-income pregnant women, low-income uh, children in low-income families, um, you know, the disabled, for example. Now, as the uh, Affordable Care Act was originally written and originally intended to be implemented, it was going to expand Medicaid eligibility to not just people falling within these categories, but all low-income uninsured um, adults. Of course, that didn't actually end up happening. In 2012, there was a Supreme Court decision in which it was decided that these Medicaid expansions would be optional. States could choose whether or not to expand Medicaid eligibility to individuals and households making up to 138% of the federal poverty level. So in 2014, um, there were 24 states that chose to forego these expansions and not expand coverage to their low-income population. This affected um, 6.7 million, as estimated by the Urban Institute, um, low-income uninsured adults who would have otherwise gained coverage through the ACA expansions. Now in the last year, there have been a couple states that have uh, sort of fallen uh, to political pressure and have opted to expand Medicaid. But um, as of the last time I checked, which was a couple weeks ago, there are still 20 states that are not intending to implement these expansions. Right? So our paper is asking, what are the consequences of this decision not to expand Medicaid eligibility as intended in the ACA um, on the low-income folks that are in these states? Right. There's already some data that's, or some evidence that's um, kind of begun to trickle out here, and I consider this paper part of this trickle. Uh, first, there was a very recent paper in JAMA um, that used Gallup data. They found that states that did not expand uh, Medicaid eligibility to their low-income populations had less of a gain in health insurance coverage. They, uh, individuals in these states were more likely to report having no personal physician or difficulty accessing Medicaid care, or sorry, medical care as compared to states that did adopt the expansions. There were also some early estimates of increased coverage from the NHIS, which is the data set I'm going to be using, that found that it, those states that adopted Medicaid, unsurprisingly, saw greater gains in health insurance coverage in um, their low-income populations. And of course, there's lots of existing evidence on what's going on with Medicaid. What does Medicaid do? So I mean, I think the Oregon health insurance experiment is one example, but perhaps the most prominent example of um, looking at an expansion besides the Affordable Care Act and trying to figure out, you know, what is Medicaid going to do? And of course, they found greater utilization, greater financial protection. Of course, you have to wonder, the population in Oregon looks a lot different than the population in the rest of the United States. And so you might be uh, curious if 
the results in Oregon are going to kind of immediately apply to all states in, um, under the ACA. Uh, otherwise, there hasn't been that much evidence, but kind of on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis, I think more evidence is coming in as more data starts coming in. So um, in our paper, we're using a restricted use version of the National Health Interview Survey from 2010 to 2014. Uh, and we're going to look at how these Medicaid expansions affected coverage, access, utilization, and self-reported health among um, the low-income population in the states that did and did not choose to expand Medicaid. Okay. So a few advantages of using this data. First of all, um, National Health Interview Survey is a very high-quality federal survey has a very high response rate, asks a very broad set of questions. So greater than 75% response rate compared to, for example, the Gallup data, something in the 5 to 7% response rate. And they also ask you know, a large set of questions on topics that we might be interested in, that we might think that health insurance is going to be affecting. So just to give you um, a quick summary of our results, just in case I, I run out of time here. So um, consistent with some of the previous research, but kind of a bit larger effects than have been found previously, we find that states that adopted the Medicaid expansion experienced much greater gains in health insurance coverage, about eight percentage point. It's about a 35% greater increase in coverage as a result. Um, as you would expect, this is largely in an uh, increase in Medicaid coverage, right? About an almost 10 per percentage point increase in Medicaid coverage in the states that adopted the expansions. Um, we also find that survey respondents report much higher rates of having higher quality health insurance. They feel that their health insurance is higher quality than it was in the previous year, which is interesting as Medicaid is usually perceived as sort of a low quality, not very good type of health insurance. We find increased uh, visits with uh, doctors, um, decreased reports that respondent has no usual place of care because of costs, and we also find increased rates of diagnoses for chronic illnesses. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get into the data a little bit more, but um, it's through the end of 2014. So we're going to be looking at the second half of 2014 as compared to 2010 through the end of 2013. Okay. Um, so the data is from the a National Health Interview Survey from 2010 through 2014. This is a nationally representative household survey. Um, all household members are asked kind of a, a small set of questions. These are in what's called the person file. And then um, within each household, there's uh, an adult that's selected to receive a little bit more of an in-depth interview. So they're asked a, a larger number of questions about their use of health care and their, their health. Um, so we're going to use outcomes from both of these data sets, although you'll see when we use the sample adult file, the sample sizes are obviously going to be smaller. Uh, we're going to look at all non-elderly U.S. citizens, um, adult citizens between the ages of 19 and 64, in families with incomes under 138% of the federal poverty level in our main analysis. But we have a pretty, uh, pretty thick appendix where we check that our results are not particularly sensitive to, you know, slightly differing the sample that we're using or um, changing our model specification a little bit. So the restricted use variable that we get from the RDC is the state of residence. So you can go online right now, you can download the National Health Interview Survey and you'll get all of this data, but you won't know where any of these people live. So of course, to do this analysis where we're comparing across states, it's really important we have this restricted use variable. So that was really nice to be able to get that in the RDC here. Now we dropped states that previously had um, Medicaid expansions to adults in this, in this income frame. Um, again, you know, in the appendix, we kind of verify how sensitive our results are to this, and it turns out not very. So if I have time, I'll show you some of those kind of alternative models. Um, the way we're going to approach this, um, because obviously there are fixed differences across states that chose and chose not to expand the uh, ACA Medicaid coverage. Um, so what we're going to do is we're not going to just compare cross-sectionally across states. We're going to look at changes that happen within states. So we're going to look at the trends that happened within the states that opted to expand Medicaid eligibility and the states that did not. And this is a difference in differences framework. So we're going to exclude the first half of 2014. We're going to sort of dummy that out because that was um, the kind of the beginning of the expansions. And we're just going to compare the second half of 2014 to the years that were previous, um, 2010 to the end of 2013. So if you're, uh, you're an equations person, then uh, this is my regression model that I'm, not going, that I'm going to be estimating. If you're not an equations person, you feel free to just uh, look at your phone for the next 30 seconds. 
But I just want to be very clear uh, kind of what our model is doing. So we have, um, we have our outcome variable. So we're going to look at things like doctors, visits, self-reported health, coverage. We have a state fixed effect, so a binary variable for each state. This is going to account for any differences across states that are constant over time. So the fact that the states um, that expanded look differently than the states that didn't expand, we're going to account for this with our state fixed effect. We're also going to include um, a, year, a year fixed effect that will account for any trends that are common to all states. And we have um, quarter dummy variables just in case there's some seasonality that we would be picking up by splitting the year up like this. So um, the first beta one is going to be the interaction between an indicator that the state opted to expand Medicaid and an indicator that the survey respondent is in the first half of 2014. So you can think of beta one as capturing sort of the very early effect of the ACA. And then beta two is our primary um, variable of interest. It's the interaction between the indicator that the state expanded Medicaid and the indicator that this was in the second half of 2014. We're also going to include some um, characteristics of the respondents, such as their race, marital status, um, number of children in the family, educational attainment, and uh, dummy variables for each age of the person responding. Okay. And as I mentioned, beta two is going to be the main uh, effect of interest. And that's going to capture how different the change was for the expansion versus the non-expansion states over this period from pre-ACA to after ACA. So our underlying assumption in this model is that in the absence of the Affordable Care Act, these states would have been on a similar trend. And so we can use the trend that we observe in the non-expansion states to give us an idea of what the trend would have been in the expansion states. Now, of course, that's a much more believable assumption if prior to the ACA, it looks like they're following about the same trend, right? So here I'm going to show you um, the results, but at the top is going to be a figure that shows just the unadjusted um, you know, whatever the dependent variable is, so here's a percent without, uh, um, percent without insurance coverage in the ACA states that we're expanding, which is the, um, the line that has the black filled in dot versus the non-expansion states, which is the kind of open triangle, right? And so um, the top line there is the uh, non-expansion states and the bottom is the expansion states. And so as you can see, in 2010, 2011, 2012, the trend 2013, the trend looks pretty similar across the two groups of states. It's only in 2014 you can see some divergence where there's a greater reduction in the fraction without insurance than um, in the expansion states than in the non-expansion states. Right? So if you want to see this more um, in terms of a table, that's what I have here at the bottom. It shows the percent uninsured uh, among the expanding states first, pre-ACA and post-ACA, then the same numbers in the non-expansion states pre and post. And one thing I do want to point out here is, as you can see on the graph, is both um, in the expanding and the non-expanding states, there was an increase in insurance coverage. This is probably through the state exchanges or increased take up among people that were already eligible. So there is uh, an effect in both states, but the difference is much larger if you just look at the expansion states. Right? So there's about um, a seven percentage point larger gain in coverage among um, the states that expanded uh, or between seven and eight percentage points gaining coverage in the states that expanded relative to the states that didn't expand. Okay. So the next outcome we look at is the fraction that have Medicaid coverage. Again, we see kind of a slight increase even in the non-expansion states that could be increased awareness um, or increased take up as a result of the mandate. But you see a much larger increase in Medicaid enrollment if you look at the states that actually expanded Medicaid coverage. So there's between an 8 and a 10 percentage point increase in Medicaid enrollment in the expansion states relative to the non-expansion states. Um, the next question that we look at is we, the survey respondents are asked, you know, has your health insurance, the quality of your health insurance improved relative to the last year? Um, here we see very similar trends prior to the Affordable Care Act and then a much larger increase in those reporting that they have better health insurance this year relative to a year ago in the states that opted to expand Medicaid coverage. Right, so you can see between 6 and 8.6 um, percentage point in relative improvement in the states that ch chose to expand Medicaid. <clears throat> okay. um, the next, so the next set of outcomes are going to look at utilization. So in this figure, I'm plotting the, um, the fraction of people that saw or talked to a general doctor in the last year. 
And uh, what you can see is there's a relative increase in states that expanded med Medicaid of between five and, uh, four and a half and five and a half percentage points. Right? So it looks like states that expanded Medicaid, people in low-income households are going to the doctor more. They're visiting the doctor more often. When we look at specialist visits, this is something um, we were particularly interested in as it's kind of thought to be one big barrier that low-income populations face is getting in to see a specialist. We see uh, some mixed evidence about um, the effect of Medicaid. In both the uh, unadjusted for covariates and adjusted for covariates, we see a relative increase of between 3 and 3.5 percentage points, although our confidence intervals are a bit larger in the adjusted model, and so we can't reject that um, that effect is different from zero. Um, so I would say at least suggestive evidence that there's also an increase in visits with a specialist. For hospitalizations, we don't find any sig relative increase that's statistically significant in the expansion versus the non-expansion states. Um, this is uh, a little bit in contrast to what they saw in the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment where they saw kind of very large increases in hospitalizations. However, um, we do note that we do see positive point estimates and we have pretty wide confidence intervals that would include treatment effects that would be similar to those found in um, Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. So this could be one area where having a relatively limited post-implementation period might be hurting us in terms of power. Um, similarly, emergency department visits, this was also an area where they found kind of large increases in the Oregon Medicaid experiment. We're not finding large increases here, um, but again, we have pretty large confidence intervals, so that would include you know, effect sizes in the neighborhood of what they saw in Oregon. Um, so the next set of outcomes we look at relate to access. So here um, are reports that individuals said that they had to delay care due to costs sometime in the last 12 months. Um, and we don't find a statistically significant effect here. We were a little bit surprised since this was kind of one thing where we would expect to see uh, a large effect. But again, you know, as I said, we're looking at a relatively short period after the ACA has been implemented. So perhaps some of these effects will materialize in another one or two years. So you, you want to get access to the RDC now so you can be ready to write that follow-up paper. That was a joke. Um, also, uh, similar results for usual source of care. We don't find any um, effects on usual source of care. If you look, the two groups seem to be trending um, you know, pretty closely together. Although one thing I would note is it does look like they're going up after the Affordable Care Act is implemented in both the expanding and the non-expanding states. So it seems like more people have a usual place of care. There's just not a differentially large increase among um, states that expanded Medicaid. Um, and then the last uh, access question, I believe, is reporting that you had no, um, no usual source of care because of costs. Here again, we find a bit mixed results. So in the adjusted model, we find a significant reduction in people saying, well, I, I wanted to have a usual source of care, but I couldn't because, um, because I didn't have insurance or it was too expensive. Um, but it's not statistically significant in the unadjusted model. So our last set of outcomes that we look at have to do with uh, being diagnosed for chronic illnesses. This is one thing people speculated could be a source of improved health for individuals if they had undiagnosed chronic illnesses. Perhaps um, expanding Medicaid coverage could help their long-term health by increasing the rates of diagnosis. Here we look at um, reports that they were diagnosed with diabetes. We find significant relative increases in um, the expansion states relative to the non-expansion states of about three percentage points to four and a half percentage points. We look at diagnosis with uh, hypertension. Again, we find positive point estimates, but our confidence intervals are pretty large, so we can't really say anything about hypertension. And then um, we have diagnosed with cholesterol. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture here because it was only asked in two years. It was asked in 2014 and it was asked in 2012. So we really only have those two pieces of data that I have in the table. But if we um, you know, sort of have you know, faith that the assumptions of the model are satisfied, we can say that there was a relative increase in, in these diagnoses. Um, so then our final set of outcomes are about self-reported health. The first is um, they asked survey respondents if their health was better than one year ago. Uh, we don't find any statistically significant effect there, but uh, um, again, positive point estimates and pretty wide confidence intervals, this could be an area for future research. Oh, uh, I, I think that might be the only self-reported health question I have here. So uh, I think I have a few minutes left yet, so I'm just going to um, flash a couple 
uh, illegible big tables in front of your eyes to try to convince you that um, we did think about robustness and we did think about the sensitivity of our um, results to sample selection. So um, the first set of columns shows the adjusted difference in differences effects when we include the state unemployment rate to account for perhaps some um, contemporaneous but unrelated change in the economic climate. It doesn't seem to affect things very much. We include the early expanders in our model. It attenuates the results a little bit, which is what we expected since this is a group that is not really experiencing as big of a gain in coverage. But overall, we see kind of a very similar pattern, increased utilization, um, decreased uh, reports of not having health insurance coverage. Um, we include non-citizens, so some non-citizens would have been Medicaid eligible if they were in the country legally. Um, again, this is a pretty small fraction of our data, and so it doesn't change the results very much. Um, we limit uh, our sample to only those making under 100% of the federal poverty level, so those between 100 and 138 would have had access to health insurance through the health insurance exchanges, so we might think that this is really the the sample that's really strongly affected by, um, by the decision not to take up the Medicaid expansions. And here we see pretty similar uh, results as in the main model, suggesting that there was some kind of effect for people in this gray zone between 100 and 138. And then finally, we exclude young adults who, in general, um, might have gained coverage through the dependent, co um, the dependent coverage mandate. Um, here we actually see a little bit sharper increase when we look at utilization. We see um, a marginally significant increase in going to the specialist and a significant increase in going to the hospital. So um, in this sample, we, we find a little bit stronger effects. And then um, again, just to sort of flash this quickly in front of you, um, so you can see that with the other outcomes, we kind of have similar results when we cut the sample in different ways. This is for the access to health and diagnoses outcomes and self-reported health outcomes. And we find, again, pretty much the same effect if uh, we include non-citizens, uh, include early adjusters, include state unemployment rate, things like that. OK, and here's um, the other two cuts that we do in the appendix. All right, so um, just a quick discussion of what the results mean. And then I'll turn it over to Clint, who will tell you about you know, other great data you can use at the RDC. Um, so we find large increases in coverage. Um, I guess I didn't show you the results for private insurance because of my limited time, but we, we didn't find any change in people reporting that they had private insurance. So that's what we would think of as economists, at least, we would call this crowd out. It doesn't seem like people are dropping their private insurance and switching on to Medicaid. Um, we find mag a magnitude of effect that's consistent with earlier estimates from NHIS, but it's quite a bit larger than what they saw in the Gallup data in their recent JAMA. Uh, we do see some increase in utilization, which is what we would probably expect from previous studies of Medicaid that tend to find that it increases the use of care. We see more doctor's visits, um, suggestive evidence of increased visits with specialists, higher rates of diagnoses of chronic conditions. We don't find any increase in emergency department visits or hospitalizations, um, which is a little bit in contrast to some previous studies, but you know, one thing that we thought was very striking is that even though we only really have two quarters of truly post-implementation data, we're already seeing some of these increases in um, the use of care. Right. Um, so we might think that you know, if people are getting in to see primary care physicians, if they're getting diagnosed, um, we might see better health down the road in a year or two. We don't find changes in self-reported health. Um, this doesn't really surprise us since people are having more uh, contact with um, medical professionals and they're learning about maybe chronic illnesses that they already had, it could give them the perception that their health is, is worse. We really, um, we don't see any change. We see you know, very small point estimates. Um, the point estimates suggest there were improvements in self-reported health, but again, it seems perhaps maybe a little bit too early to uncover these sort of effects. All right, that's um, all I have. I guess Clint is up next. Thanks. Okay, so I'm Clint Carter. I am the administrator of the Michigan Research Data Center. We are part of the Federal Statistic Research Data Centers. Uh, we're sponsored by the U.S. Census Bureau and the University of Michigan. And we house a lot of data. So I'm going to briefly introduce you to the details of an RDC, go over the data that we house, 
and provide some information on how you can access that data. So what is an RDC? It's a secure computing environment where qualified researchers can uh, work on approved projects accessing non-public census and other federal data. We are currently located in the Institute for Social Research, in the basement actually, in a brand new lab where we moved last year, so it's a beautiful place. Um, we even, Maggie, the director, painted sky on the ceiling, so it looks like you, not in a basement, you can actually look up and see clouds and birds that don't move, but they're beautiful. Anyways, um, so let's see. So why would you want to use our data? Much like Sarah suggested, we offer greater detail and finer geography. So with our demographic data, typically you can get down to the census block as opposed to what you would get in the public use microsample, which is the Puma. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason would be that you can access data sets that we, for which there is no public version. That's typical of the business data sets that we house. Um, and then you can link to our data. So you can bring in external data that might have PII information on it and create one-to-one -one link, individual level links with some of our restricted data. So for example, with the POMS data versus RDC, RDC has lower levels of geography, no top coding, larger samples, and greater detail and variables. For example, we would have more race categories than you would find in the public use version. You can also get place of birth, uh, we offer some write-in responses, and with the health data, uh, there are disease codes. Can you tell us what you mean by top coding? So top coding would be, for some of the, with the, with the decennial or ACS data, they don't show, I don't know the percentile, but the top percentage of incomes. So those are gone, because you wouldn't, you would be able to identify, uh, not me, but someone that makes a lot more than me, <laughs> you would be able to identify that person. Uh, question? Yes. It depends on the, the data set. We have Numidon data, which actually offers, a, I think it's a city, and maybe even slow, lower than that. I, Sarah's on the project that's using that, I believe, in county and, county and city place of birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, that's a fairly new data set that we have in the lab. Um, and we have a project linking it to ACS and looking at the war on poverty and where people were born and looking at outcomes. Do you have country of birth if they're outside? We do have country of birth also. So some of the household data sets that we have would be the decennial from 1960 through 2010. We have the ACS, which is the, uh, basically it's the new long form version of the decennial. And that's from 1996 through 2011. We have the current population survey, March and December supplements. However, we are working on getting new supplements. I think we now have the tobacco use supplement available. Uh, our website offers more detail on the, the new CPS data sets that we have. Uh, some additional data sets would be the Survey of Income and Program Participation, American Housing Survey, which is a unique survey that actually surveys houses. So it not, does not look at, well, the, the, the people residing in the house answer the survey, but if five years from now a new family is in that house, they answer the survey. So it's basically the house that's being surveyed. Uh, we have National Crime Victimization Survey, National Survey of College Graduates, the NLMS, the NLS, and we have Social Security administrative, administrative data, as well as housing and urban development data. One of the unique data sets that we have in, in our lab was the longitudinal employer household data set. So that is a combination of household data and business data, where you can get information on the employer, all the characteristics of the employer, and all of the employer's employees and their characteristics, such as race, uh, sex, age, um, I think we have some imputed education variables and salary. I'm trying to get through this fast. So this is the exciting thing I think with our data is that internal data, most of our demographic data has been picked where they've replaced PII information with a personal identification key. So if you have external data at the individual level, you can bring that into our lab and merge it with our data uh, at the individual level, which is pretty unique. Another thing that you can do with most of our data sets is link at the geographic level. Um, and this is true for 
firm level data as well, where if you're looking at business firms, you can bring that in, link it to our firm identifiers, and also perform analysis on the businesses. Business data, we could spend all day about talking about business data because we have a lot of data sets. Um, economic censuses, the longitudinal business database, quarterly financial report, SBO, MEPS IC, annual capital expenditure survey, BIRDIS. Really, if you want to know about businesses, we have some kind of data that will help you understand it. And if you are interested in that sort of research, I invite you to meet with me and we can go over it in detail. We even have more, so we get through these. So how do you access these data? First, you have to, yes, sir? Uh, a couple of slides ago, you said MEPS uh, insurance component. Yes. But I remember uh, a decade ago, there was a merger underway with MEPS. Um, household. Household and NHI, NHIS. Do you have something? Not that I'm aware of. Actually, I think we do. I'm sorry. I think we do have an NCHS data set that includes MEPS also. Yeah. I have a slide later on that discusses the NCHS data sets that are available. I don't think that one's listed, but I do believe I've seen that. So you identify the data you need. Talk to me. Talk to uh, the executive director, Maggie Levenstein. Uh, we'll set up a meeting with you, ask you to write a brief two-page summary of, or not two-page, two-paragraph summary of what you would like to research, and we will go over the data that's available, suggest data that you might not be aware of, and uh, send you away, away with a template to write a proposal for the Census Bureau. Um, the proposal process is non-trivial. It's a 15-page proposal, single-spaced. Uh, one unique thing about our proposals is that you're research has to benefit the Census Bureau. So that's something that most researchers don't think of, but due to Title 13 and Title 26, Census Bureau requires predominant purpose to be the benefit of the Census Bureau. Some other unique things about our data, uh, we have exemption from the IRB, there's no informed consent, and the coolest thing for uh, response rates is we have mandatory participation. So we have very large samples. I could go into detail about the predominant purpose statements, but in the interest of time, I won't do that. But there are 13 criterions from which you may choose two, and your research must accomplish those two things during the life of your project. Uh, notes about census proposals, please plan ahead. Uh, you typically take six, to, six months to a year to get access. You must work with us because if you don't, you won't write in the language that Census likes to hear. So we're, we are well versed in that and we can help you write very boring proposals that don't excite anyone. <laughs> and, and those will pass review at the Census Bureau. You also will be required to obtain special sworn status, which is a security clearance. Um, for the past seven years, the uh, Census Security Department will want to know what you've done, where you've worked, where you've lived, how many times you've entered and exited the country. Um, they will ask for references for each place that you've lived and worked. And they will send out a letter to each of the references that you've listed. You will also have a one-on-one -on -one interview with the FBI agent, and you'll be fingerprinted. So <laughs> it's a very secure environment. Um, Yes, sir. Just to use the census data sets or any of the data sets that sit in the census? Because they're all housed in the, the lab and you may see something that you shouldn't see or you have to have security clearance to use the lab. So Sarah uses NHIS data, but she has census security clearance at the IR at the highest level. It's a moderate risk secure environment. Work environment. Uh, everything is running on Unix in the R RDC. Um, preliminary output can only be viewed in the RDC. While you're in the RDC, we don't provide internet access uh, for secure reasons. Uh, software that we offer would include SAS, Data R, MATLAB, Gauss. We have quite a few packages that you can use. Most people use Stata, at least uh, from the econ department. 
And um, one thing about NCHS projects is that you must work while I'm in the office. That's an NCHS policy. Census data and, uh, and AHRQ data, their policies allow you to work 24-7 in the lab, but NCHS restricts your access to when uh, I'm present. Disclosure process, no output can leave the RDC without review. We plan ahead, it takes three weeks or so to get your output out. Uh, basically, I look at it to make sure you pass certain thresholds, such as sample sizes and concentration ratios and other things. Um, once I approve it, it goes to the disclosure officer at Census. He or she looks at it and finally approves it or comes back with questions. Finally, information about health data. So the avail available data that we have for health would include the MEPS household component from the AHRQ agency. Very easy to get access to. They're, they're a super cool agency. Uh, they also get their output, your results back to you within the typically the same day. So super good. Um, and then National Center for Health Statistics. And this is not an all-encompassing list, but it's the NHIS, NHANES. I don't know if you're familiar with NHANES, but they do some pretty neat uh, physical exams of everybody, blood tests and everything. Small sample because of the detail that goes into that survey, but it's, it has a lot of information. Survey of family growth, national vital statistics system, national health care surveys. You can see all of those. And then how to contact me. So I've left some brochures at the back table. I handed out some brochures to people who were here earlier. Uh, if you have interest in using our data, I welcome you to contact me and we can start talking about it. And uh, any questions, I guess, for Sarah or me? Sure. I to just talk about the, the process from a researcher standpoint of getting access. Um, so, yeah, I found that getting special sworn status is a bit time consuming. Um, you definitely want to budget for that, but it's not, uh, it's not that difficult. Like, you, you know, we're all used to writing kind of proposals and things, and so they just want to know that you're um, using the data appropriately. Um, it takes a long time to get approval. Like, so for my projects, I've usually had to do, and maybe this is just me not writing the proposals well enough, but I've usually had to do at least one round of revisions based on their comments um, before it was approved, but, um, I mean, I don't. I didn't. I didn't find it particularly arduous. Um, you can't remote into the RDC, which, you know, if you like to work in your office, is a little inconvenient. But um, it's open 24/7 here, so, you know, as long as you're not using uh, NCHS data, you can come in 24/7. Um, yeah. So I have. I mean, I have several projects at the RDC right now, and it's it's been really great, especially with the new Numidant link. You can link to people's county of birth, which is really cool if you like. So I have a lot of projects on like long-term effects of Medicaid coverage in childhood. And so being able to see where someone was born, you can learn a lot about the probability that they would have had Medicaid as a kid. And then you can track their fertility, their um, you know employment outcomes, human capital outcomes, like educational attainment. So it's been really cool. That's my perspective. Thank you. <laughs> if you have a, a BA appointment, usually you have to go through that fingerprinting and background check. Is that you have to do it again? Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, you do. I don't know why. They do, the agencies don't talk to each other. And, yeah. Uh, so the, the obvious, the direct lag is that these approvals and fingerprinting, but the, the research lag, if you will, is that you have to decide, hmm, I got to get in there because I need to know this and that will give me access to that. So uh, I guess what I'm, I'm kind of asking, but I'm kind of commending you that you already had in your head ideas to do important research so that then you could go through this process. Oh. Yeah, I should, I should say or we should make clear, you only have to go through it once. So once you have the fingerprinting and everything, you're, you're in the system, you have to apply to use the data again. So like I had um, NCH data for a different project and I wanted to use it for this, so I had to go back and get approved for that. But you don't have to go through the whole Rigor, rigmarole you have to go through the first time. So once you're in, as long as you keep up your trainings, you have to do like some very straightforward and not difficult trainings. Once you're online, you like click through and then they 
like true or false, you can instill people's identity. Or something. Like you do do a quiz at the end, right. but and you don't have to go through the false, whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. No problem. For example, we never hear from you again one day. We'll just know that you're a squirrel into this place. Yeah, exactly. They had to disappear me or something, right? right. right? I, I knew I knew too much. Right, I knew the state right. identifiers in the NHIS. But um, yeah, once you do it once, then you can just you're kind of you're golden. Yeah. What about showing that your study has value to the Census Bureau? What, the study that you presented today, was it difficult to convince them of that? Yeah, so this was NCHS, so I didn't, I didn't really have to show that. But it's only for census. It's only for only census, census, yeah. Data. That's correct. But like my understanding from friends I know that use the census is it's, it's reasonably broad. I mean, you can make a case for a lot of different things. Right, yeah. so you have to choose two benefits. Uh, one of the benefits are the estimates of your project. So that one's done for you. The other one, uh, we try to make it to where it's something that you will need to do to complete your analyses, like if there's data cleaning that needs to be done or quality assessments of variables when you're comparing external data with internal data, that can be a benefit to the Bureau also. So really, it's not too difficult. Um, you do have to provide a technical memorandum at the end of your project detailing how you've done these, what you promised to do, uh, but that's about it. Anything else? Sorry to be on my kid, I guess. I got another question about lags. When, when you were trying to understand some of the things that came out pejoratively disappointing, I'm thinking about these lags of these people getting coverage, mm -hmm. finding a doctor, getting an appointment, finding something's wrong, mm -hmm. tick, 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 and you're out of time, and therefore you haven't had hospitalization or some other stuff. Yeah, I, I'm, I totally uh, agree with you. So this is, I mean, this is, the results I was showing you are just based on the second half of 2014. So this time next year, we'll have kind of another year worth of data. In fact, I think um, some of the variables for the 2015 NHIS the, um, for the first quarter of 2015 have been released already. So, um, but I don't think the state identifiers have been made available yet. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we went into this project knowing this, these are the early effects, there can be effects that get bigger over time. And I, th I think it was interesting that we already saw some really strong effects on, you know, um, things like diagnoses and going to the doctor and, um, you know, at least feeling that you have better health insurance than before. Definitely. Observing those yet, I think it's heartening that there could be some, and we see some of these chronic illness diagnoses, so there could be some of these health improvements that could prevent future you know, use of care. I have a question about um, some of the MEPS data that's available. So on the MEPS I see has the summary tables that have come through I'm wondering if there's, a, if there's an option where instead of diving all the way in and getting approval, if there's a, a way to request to get the data cut a little bit differently and get summary data without having to really dive back into the data. Right, so there, there is a way to do that. The Census Bureau has a special tabs unit. Um, I think you can find that information on census.gov. And there is a fee, I don't know what the fee is, but there is a fee to do that, but it might be worth your while instead of going through the entire process, yeah. So I think I just wanted to emphasize that um, this is a resource we have at the University of Michigan that most other universities don't have. And um, I, I've worked in this secure environment before and people travel from you know, other states to come and work in this secure environment here because we have it. 
and here it is at our university. So it's something we really should be taking advantage of. They have an enormous amount of data uh, and very sophisticated ways of working with it and, uh, and an incredible amount of local knowledge about how to use these data sets and how to, so some of them our investigators have developed. <laughs> And um, so working in this environment is a real privilege and something that most other places don't have. Uh, and you guys can take advantage of it relatively easily compared to most other researchers who have to either travel here or get someone here to do it for them. Uh, and I'd encourage you to go ahead and get your clearance and go over and see what they have because it's really a pretty remarkable resource. And more questions we can send by email or oh, connect you later. Thank you so much. Thank you.